Hey folks, how are you doing? <laughs> As in after all the wind? <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, getting by, kind of. I'm actually interested to see. Um, I know at least one person was without power. Um, and, and might be struggling. Could be. Ooh, oh my goodness. Ooh. Yikes. Yeah, I recently had to like install French drains well, was a couple years ago and great do redo some grading and stuff because because of flooding into our window well. this It's a problem to have a big hole right next to your house. Oh, it was. Yeah, we had all kinds of wind here, too. Uh, let's see. What are we missing? So Camille was without power. Um, so we're missing Amy, Derek, and Jake still. Hmm. We'll give them a minute or so to, to show up. I uh, want to encourage everyone, if you've got questions on the exam, um, to, to ask me. I've been trying to be responsive with all that. Um, the other thing is I totally messed up the posting of the warm up. Um, and besides, we're we're going even slower than I expected. So I just pushed that back to to Friday. Uh, so uh, the reading of section nine four and the warm up for that. Yeah, the originally had been for today. Let's just make it for Friday. Um, I I saw. As of earlier this morning, only one person had attempted it, and because it was kind of hard to find, it wasn't in the right location, of course. And um, it asked you an open-ended question, and your responses were true or false. It was like, in what way does such and such? So that didn't make sense at all. Um, so th that's for after your exam, though. Let's see, we've got six. Trolls, yes. Better than foo. Uh, Cool. Um, so let's get started. Hopefully Jake will be able to join us. Hopefully even Camille will be too. I am, a, am already recording though. Um, and if we're still missing them, then we'll keep it. We may end a bit early just to, to keep them from falling too far behind. Class nap time. No, 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 no. Um, uh, Carter's already voted agree. Thanks, Carter. For back on our back here. Um, now l l let's actually talk some. Yes, light leaks. Let's talk about light and matter. Light inside your eyelid. Well, maybe not inside your eyelids. Light inside of matter. Um, so we're going to get to that. See. Um, so let's start off with Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations. They're eye opening. Um, so. Uh, we're going to take a look at what happens uh, in matter. Then we're going to look at the interface um, between two different types of matter. Uh, so we remember we started out, we'd gotten our Maxwell's equations, and they were actually in this mixed format with, whoa, all right, I'm get, I, I remapped my drawing pad, and I'm getting used to it. I'm, my apologies. Um, so we've got them in terms of D, our displacement field, but also in terms of our electric field. 
right? And, and then the divergence of the displacement field was zero because we're saying, hey, let's look in the situation where there's no free charge around. All right, here comes Jacob. So we're just missing. Cool. Um, that is a D. Do you want me to clarify that there? Uh, whoever's our pointing there? Dude, let's clean it up. This is our electric displacement field. Um, and never changing, always true. Divergence of B is zero. And, but again, we've got this mix between our types of fields. Got B mixed with H. And here, this. So this is coming from chapter seven. This. Um, so this is true in general. It's storming really bad at your house. Okay, power slickering. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if if we lose you, I'm recording. Um, but um, and we'll we'll you know we'll see. Uh, you know, if we need to, we'll, we'll, we'll figure this out. Um, so, so we're going to take a look. Um, these are always true. We're going to start off simple. Um, make sure our media are linear and also not just linear, but um, their permittivity and permeability don't vary. All right, so in that case, then we can simplify because we know that our um, electric displacement is just linearly proportional to our electric field and um, our auxiliary field, H, likewise, just linearly proportional to this magnetic field here. Um, so what does it mean to be homogeneous? It just means that, that they don't vary in space, right? So if we were, we, normally we could have our permittivity here and our permeability, whoops, and that's not supposed to be a mu naught. That's just supposed to be a mu. Um, those could both be functions of position, but in this case, they're just going to be uniform throughout space. Um, so, all right, so now we've got that, then we can actually, for Gauss's law, we can rewrite that and divide out the epsilon because it's here when there's uh, no free charge, the divergence of D was equal to zero. So then we can divide out that epsilon and we've got this, still have divergence of B equal to zero. Um, Curl of E is still given by Faraday's law. And now um, over here, right, we can factor out uh, for Maxwell's part of the Ampere-Maxwell law. We can factor out the mu and move it over to the right-hand side. And we can factor out the epsilon. So here we'll have the curl of B, I've moved the mu over to the other side. And so I get a mu and I'm going to pull an epsilon out of the D. And this just becomes DE, DT, right? And so now at this point, um, what we have is, um, looks the same as what we had for Maxwell's equations in vacuum. But the only thing that's different is um, where we had mu naught epsilon naught, we've replaced it with mu epsilon for our particular material. And so remember that mu, <clears throat> the mu naught epsilon naught uh, in our wave equation, right, appeared in our wave equation. Um, so that was the speed. So our V. Now, though, is going to, instead of 1 over mu naught epsilon naught, 
uh, square root is going to be square root of 1 over mu epsilon, just like that. And so that looks very similar um, to what we had before. And so it, it's still, right, these are just uh, differing by a constant mul multiplicative factor from uh, mu naught and epsilon naught. So we can actually just group that together and say, hey, that's the speed of light in a vacuum divided by some number n. Um, and we're going to define this n, which we're going to call the index of refraction, right? It's just a ratio of our permittivity times permeability divided by those values for free space. So you learned in like fun two um, about the index of refraction in terms of refraction of light, and we'll get to that in a moment. But what I want to emphasize right here, a um, couple things, right? Oops. Let's go. That's that's an epsilon that, that you're pointing to there, pointing person. Oh gosh, um, I just messed this up. Let me see if I can do this right. Probably not. Stop it. Bad things are happening. Um, gosh. Um, give me a moment here. Strange things are happening. All right, you, let me try this one more time. Can I select this? Yes, boxes, giving me trouble. There we go. Cool. Um, who's doing that? Put that away. Stop drawing my whiteboard. Pyramid, no. All right. So um, what I want to emphasize right here is the the um, uh, index of refraction is uh, actually the ratio of how slow, how much slower um, light is traveling in this medium. Right? <laughs> Stop it. I'm going to turn you all off. Um, so, <laughs> um, one of the things we're going to say actually about our index of refraction here, though, um, is that uh, for most materials, um, we actually don't have any strong variation in their magnetic properties. Uh, so I know. So, in most materials, our mu is about equal to mu naught. It's not true for everything. And so we have the general equation uh, there, but um, but for most things that we see, particularly like with regular optics, uh, this is the case. And so um, in that case, then our index of refraction, right, is just gonna be square root of epsilon over epsilon naught, which we had a name for that, right? That is, the relative permittivity, which is also known as the dielectric constant, right? So, uh, and I should here, I'm going to put, this is going to be a wavy equals, pretty close to square root of the dielectric constant. Um, so if we know, right, how, uh, how a material gets polarized under an electric field, from that we can tell its index of refraction. Of course, one of the things we're going to see is that, that this permittivity, the index, of, and hence the index of refraction, can vary with frequency too. So it's different for a DC field versus an oscillating field at different frequencies. But to lowest order, we can take them to be constant. Um, so, and, and we end up modifying um, our other quantities li likewise. Um, yeah, it's. That's, does N change? Uh, so two questions. I'm going to answer Nick's first, and then I'll come back to Carter's. Um, the 
Um, does n change in response to a, an external field? It, it can, right? It, and particularly if you have a really strong uh, field, then you can also modify how, you know, it basically um, writing, doing all this, we assume that the uh, permittivity was linear uh, with E. So it, but it could be that it actually varies with higher powers of E. And so then, yeah, the index of refraction will change as the uh, magnitude of E changes and, and other things too. You can apply an electric field one way and that can modify the index of refraction in that direction, but not another direction, for example. Um, and that's a really useful technique. So there, there are all kinds of uh, s instruments built using that modification of the, um, of the uh, index of refraction with an applied electric field uh, that, yeah, used for all kinds of different things, uh, including some really fast uh, switches in, in the backbone of the internet. Uh, so, uh, cool. But we're gonna start off simple. Everything's just constant, no variations, just a, a, a constant proportionality. Carter had asked why, yeah, so our magnetic effects in general are, are very, very small. It's, you need to, to have relatively you know, we've seen that like you have to go to fairly extreme situations to have the magnetic field have as large an effect as the electric field. Um, so um, that doesn't answer it on a deeper level why that's true, but um, I'll just say it's, it's consistent with a lot of other things we've seen too. Okay. Um, and that's, again, it's not to say we can always ignore it, it's just sometimes we can. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, for other quantities too, we just make that same substitution of mu for mu naught and epsilon for epsilon naught. So for our energy density, instead of having one half epsilon naught times e squared, we just have epsilon times e squared plus instead of one over mu naught, it's just one over mu times b squared. And for our pointing vector, Right. We can take this to be one over mu instead of mu naught e cross b. Right. Uh, what else? So uh, we remember that we have a relationship uh, between our um, angular frequency, the wave number, and the velocity. Oops. Right. Because now we've got V, we've got uh, the speed of light can vary inside the material. Uh, we also had a relationship between the amplitudes. Right. We said that the amplitude of the magnetic field wave was one over C. So now it's just going to be whatever the local speed is times epsilon, times the electric field amplitude. Um, same thing, our intensity, right? Instead of being one half epsilon naught C, E squared is just gonna be one half epsilon C, E naught squared, et cetera. Okay, so we've got this w relatively straightforward transformation. Um, from what things look like in vacuum to what they look like in a homogeneous linear medium. Let me just save a snapshot of this here. Someone looking at this will wonder, what is the only thing bringing whom joy? Okay, cool. All right, so there's our field of matter. Let's take a look at what happens when you're at the boundary between two different materials. So here. All right, so here, let me draw the interface right here. 
and we're going to have material one over here, material two over here. We can make them, I don't know, different colors. So here's material one over here, and here's material two over here. Um, all right, so um, one of the things we saw actually in chapter six, there was a one little section that I said, hey, we're going to come back to this later on. And that was a chapter that that's where we laid out what the boundary conditions were at some interface. And we're not going to go back through and re-derive them, but you can always take a look at that section in chapter six again, if you'd like. Um, so we, in material, we can break up our fields into components that are perpendicular to the interface. So those would be, um, that would be something pointing normal like this, right? Left to right in the image up above. Uh, and I'm gonna finish writing this out. And then we can also have components that are parallel to it. So one direction that's parallel to the interface. Whoops, I left out the symbol, parallel, parallel. So one direction that's parallel to the interface runs vertical. But I wrote these actually as vectors because there are actually two dimensions that run parallel to this interface. There's also into and out of the screen, right? And so any linear combination of those, so up, down in the picture and in and out of the screen or anything in that plane, really. Um, so we've got that. And then we also have continuity of the perpendicular component of the magnetic field, um, but this proportional discontinuity of the parallel component of the magnetic field. That's one over mu one. Like that. And so, um, the reason why we have this discontinuity right here for this component and this component right here um, uh, arises from two different things here. Let's, right. we have a discontinuity at, uh, at a surface um, when there's charge present there. And so here we're still talking about not having a free charge, right? But when we have, a dis, an edge of a material, or in this case, edge of two different materials, right? Then we can have um, bound charge there, right? We all, even in a homogeneous field, right? We have bound charge occurring at the edge of our material. And same thing right here. This is. If we have an abrupt change in magnetization, then we can have bound current. But notice that a sheet of bound charge, right, isn't going to contribute any electric field component perpendicular, I mean, parallel to it, nor is it going to contribute any magnetic field perpendicular to the bound current. And so that's why we only have discontinuity in certain currents. I mean, certain components, my goodness, right? Um, all right, so these boundary conditions are actually gonna motivate what we do for the next uh, while. Are you, oh, are you still getting me okay? I've got a poor connection right now. Still, still getting signal? Good, still going to my end. Okay, I was just getting an alert. Um, here, so what I'm going to do right now, let's do this right here. Um, let me draw another picture. I'm going to separate this out right here, and we're going to, I'm not boxing it necessarily 
because this is like, oh, like this is something, well, it is something that we're going to use a lot, but you don't need to memorize it or anything. You can just refer back to it. I just want to separate it out uh, from what I'm going to write next. Um, let's take a look now at what happens when we have a wave coming in that is um, going to strike this. Uh, I'm going to draw a diagram just so that we're used to uh, what's going on. Um, yeah, let's do it right here. All right, so um, we're going to have the wave traveling along the z direction. Actually, give me a second. I'm going to do this differently. So wave's going to travel in the z direction. We're going to, the interface is going to be in the x y plane. Okay. So this is going to be z, x, x, y, like that. Um, right. And and really, what we could do is is this is our interface right here. So this is the division between the two materials is in this plane right here. Oh, I see. We run off the active area of my pad to change how I map this. Um, to, 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 all right, so that's the interface between the orange and green between, between material one and material two over here. Right. And so we're going to send in our wave like before. Our wave is going to be heading in the Z direction, V right here. And it's got one speed, medium one. And some of the wave is going to continue on this way. Some of it's going to get reflected. When it's in this medium, it's got a different speed. Um, and just for definiteness, let's choose the polarization direction be in the x direction. So this right here is going to be my incident electric field. Like that. I can put a vector on that if we want to. And so, all right. If it's traveling in the z direction, the electric field is in the x direction, we know which way the magnetic field is. It has to be perpendicular to both of them. And so that just leaves the only option is in the y direction. So that's B sub i for incident. And then same thing right here. It's not necessarily obvious, but we will we'll see where this comes in. Here will be our transmitted electric field, same direction, and um, a transmitted magnetic field. That, whoops. So. Okay, so we're going to write down the, the expressions for these uh, fields. Um, but as before, we want to stick with complex notation just because it will make the math so much easier. So our, our incident electric field, which is only going to vary with Z and T, right? it's plane waves, only going to vary with Z. We're going to put a, turn that into a complex function. And so it will have a complex amplitude, but we're going to have to label it with an I. Complex amplitude right there. And so then it's got an E to the I. It's got to be K1 because it'll have a different wavelength than the different materials. Z minus omega T. 
And just like we saw before, oh, and it's polarized in the x direction. Just like we saw before, though, right, the wave has to have the same frequency, even in the different materials. What can change is the wave number, and hence the wavelength. We're going to ignore delta. Delta, remember, gets it gets absorbed into that complex amplitude right here. So this is, if I wrote this out in the real component, would be a cosine of kz minus omega t plus delta. Or so we could write that as e to the i kz e minus omega t plus delta. But then we take that delta and we absorb it into the, where's the, my, uh, we absorb it into here. Yeah. But thanks for asking, because I'm sure other people were wondering the same thing. Um, I my connection seems to be pretty bad right now. Um, let's see. So now we can write the other thing. Other bit. Ah, oh, the other thing, other field. Our infinite magnetic field. My camera is off. Okay. Um, give me one moment. I'm gonna go bellow at my kids. I, they're probably streaming a whole bunch of video or something. Either that or there's just something else going on. Give me a second. Hey, Lisa, can you ask the kids, are they streaming video? Um, can you ask them not to? I'm getting sandy. All right. <laughs> now we have entered the bandwidth wars in my household. Um, I, my video is going to be off. Hey, Camille's here. Welcome. Um, I'm going to just shut off my video. Uh, yeah. That bad. <laughs> I didn't see what you're writing up there, whoever that was. <laughs> uh, so, um, right, we know that uh, we just have, yay, <laughs> glad you're with us. Um, I have been recording. Uh, we've got a, I've got a pretty spotty connection, it seems like, here. Uh, so, um, yeah, it looks like it may have shut off my regular, my video. Um, and let me know if there's, you know, if, if you start to lose me for other reasons. So our, our magnetic field now, right, is uh, going to have the same amplitude, same phase. Um, and so I can actually just write it like this. And we know the amplitude is just modified by factor 1 over V. Now we're in a material, and so instead of 1 over C, it's whatever the, the local speed is. Uh, um, but notice, right, we've got the same complex amplitude. So it is, um, uh, what am I going to call it? Um, it, it's still in phase. Oh, so this right here is, so I'm going to finish writing this out, e to the i k1z minus omega t. And this is now in the y direction. Right, so this right here was specifically, though, for our incident wave. So we'll do the same thing for the transmitted wave, but there's a third wave, which is the reflected wave. Right, so this one here is, oh my goodness, that I don't like that, it's scaring me. There we go. That's my incident wave there. Um, so let's let's uh, once we've established how to do this, we can quickly uh, for the. Um, other one, so for our ref our transmitted wave, right, it's going to be the exact same thing, except obviously it's a different wave, so we'll give it a different subscript and a different complex amplitude. And the other thing it has right here is the wave number is different because the transmitted wave is in the second material. Uh, 
that's still a vector. So it's a vector and it's complex. Sorry, it's so crowded there. And so this first, I'm sorry, the incident wave, I'm going to make a, I forgot to include when I wrote the magnetic field for the incident wave, the amplitude was one over V1, right? And I need to specify that. And so now the amplitude for the transmitted wave is one over V2, the speed in the second medium times E naught transmitted. It's, And then the third wave, which isn't drawn, is the reflected wave. Right? And that's still, so that one's going to be back in material one, to the left of the interface. So we can write that out. So it has a complex, whoops, complex vector amplitude. That's supposed to be an R for reflected. So it's got some complex amplitude. Um, and so it's e to the i, and we'd have k1z, except it's going to the left. So to show that it's going the opposite direction, I would put a minus sign on that wave vector. Then over here, do some similar things for a reflected field here, reflected magnetic field. I'm going to start off like this. And we're going to go back. I left a little bit of space before that V because we're going to go back and modify that in a second. This is E to the I, again, minus K1 Z minus omega T the y direction. And so one thing is missing right here. If we take a look at the fact that um, our field travels in the same direction as a pointing vector, so that's E cross B is the direction. So if our field is to the left and our E is pointing in the same direction, so to get the pointing vector reflected, we so that it's heading to the left and so to the right as compared to the, the incident wave, we have to flip one of those two vectors. And this is it right here. Right? One of the ways to think of it is, so I, I'm putting a minus sign, and I'm going to put here, I'll put a orange circle around that. Just, that's not a circle. <laughs> um, one way to think of it, yeah, is to flip right. And one way to think why, you know, ugh, that doesn't work either. Um, why are we just flipping B? One way to think of it is, right, we, B is 1 over V times uh, the amplitude, uh, the electric field amplitude, and V is changed direction. So that's why we've got the minus sign right here. So we can think of it as 1 over minus V1 right here. So, <clears throat> whoop, yeah, Nick. Um, I'm still a bit confused on the boundary conditions. Okay. Um, yeah. I, so first of all, why why do we have to worry about them? Like, how does it relate to the reflected thing? Yeah. So th that's exactly. So, so you're asking at exactly the right point. Uh, uh, that is what we're going to do next. Um, we've got these three different waves, but we have to satisfy these boundary conditions. So that actually is going to help us relate what these different, for example, the different, uh, what the different amplitudes are going to be. And so we can see how much gets transmitted, how much gets reflected as a function of 
basically epsilon one, epsilon two, mu one, and mu two. And that's going to be imposed by these boundary conditions onto these right here. Can you can you remind me how you derive the boundary conditions? Like um, how do you know that one's equal to the other? Yeah. Um, so, so if we had no change in material, right, uh, then the fields would just be the same on the left and right side. Um, the uh, um, this right, we, if we have a change in material, then you're going to have at the surface, right? So so long as like you know we've got a uniform <coughs> external field applied, but you'll have different polarizations in here. So you'll have different Ds in one versus two. So you'll have um, uh, or so you'll or another way I'm sorry different polarizations in one versus two so that means that there'll be a bound charge selected on this interface right here and so that's equivalent to just having you know empty space with a little bit of free charge right here on top of that external uh, electric field and so that means that there'll be that that this sheet of bound charge at the interface will create some field pointing to the left and some field pointing to the right in the right side, in the left to the left and the left side to the right and the right side. And so that leads to a discontinuity in the components perpendicular to the interface, perpendicular to the sheet of bound charge. But there's no change in the electric field parallel to it. Right, so that basically that's applying Gauss's law to a sheet of bound charge right here. And similarly, right, if there's a discontinuity in the magnetization because there's a discontinuity in the permeability, then you'll end up with a sheet of bound current at that interface. And so there'll be a discontinuity, in the field components uh, parallel to it, um, and specifically parallel to the sheet, but also perpendicular to the bound current in the sheet. Um, but there's no discontinuity in the, in the magnetic field perpendicular to it. Um, so that, that's kind of a verbal. Um, I don't. We're not going to have time to go all the way through it. Um, it is in a section in chapter six, though. If you'd like to. to, to uh, one more. One more quick thing. Um, yeah. So I understand that there's a discontinuity there. Mm -hmm. So why are we equating the two things on the? Um, different surfaces here. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, so 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 we've got a, a um uh, do, 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 right. So so um so so why are we equating? So you're saying like in this equation right here? Yeah, we're talking about that. There's a discontinuity and right, but so so it's not an arbitrary discontinuity. Um, it is uh, it's given by the amount of bound the of bound charge, and so you would have positive bound charge from one material and negative bound charge for the other, and so you could write this at, if you took this as the difference in these two right here that that you could see you could write it that way. Um, uh, so the the w there's a yeah. Um, so we've got this, and and we're going to use the same discontinuity, right? When we in the perpendicular components. Notice all these components right here, right? The way we've drawn it is that the electric and magnetic field are both parallel. So we're really actually only going to be dealing with the right-hand two equation in this setup. Once we start dealing with waves that are coming in at an angle, then we'll have both kinds of components present potentially. But for now, it's just these. Um, give me one second to screenshot this again. And then we'll go ahead and apply this, those boundary conditions to these situations. Um, This is, it would certainly be nice to have a much bigger board because we're going to draw on these things right here. Um, but uh, so keep in mind that we're going to draw on, on these three equations right here, applying these boundary conditions. But we're going to do it much the same way we did uh, when we were doing it for waves in general uh, earlier on, a couple classes back. Um, so here, let's go here. So, um, one of the things we know is that 
um, from, uh, let me see where I am right here. Um, right, so, oh, wrong thing. Right, this is what I mentioned. We've only got those components now, right? If we came in at an angle, we could have the other components, so two. Um, so if we look at the components parallel, right? So remember we had E1 parallel was equal to E2 parallel. So, <clears throat> On the left, we have the incident and reflected waves, and we can actually just factor out uh, the common uh, E to the I, K1, Z1. Oh, I'm sorry, we can plug in, uh, to, to, we can, let me see, we can factor out into common E to the I uh, here. Let me just say something on left. Right, we've got E1, E incident plus E, that was an incident reflected. And on the right, we just have E transmitted, right? And what we're gonna do is factor out um, an E to the minus I omega T that's common to all the terms. And at the interface, we've got z equals zero. And so the e to the i k z, whether it's k1 or k2, gives us just a factor of one. So what we're left with then is just this, the complex amplitudes because right, the exponential terms we could either factor out or we're just equal to one. So our complex amplitudes were equal to each other. Like that. Um, and then from the other bit, whoops, so mu one, one over mu one, B one, uh, right. Um, same, we're going to have a similar type of thing, um, but uh, we can say on the left, right, we've got the incident field, right? Um, and the reflected field. And on the right, we've got just the transmitted field. But one of the things we have is we know that the magnetic fields, right, we have the one over V for each of them with a plus or a minus, right? And so we've got V equals one over V times the electric field. And this is a plus or minus, right? Depends on the situation. Sorry, that's really hard to see what I was doing. Plus or minus right there. Um, and then the other thing is, again, we're gonna factor out E to the minus I omega T that's common to all of them. And um, also at the interface, We've got z equals zero, so the x the exponentials are all gone, and we're left with remember it's one over mu one. Instant waves uh, amplitude is one over v one uh, times the amplitude of the electric field. And then we've got a minus one over V1. 
not her. And then here, this is one over two. Okay, so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to actually clean this up. So I'm going to take this up to the next uh, column over here, and we're going to we're going to multiply through by um, mu one v one, right? And so um, I've got right here and here. Let's label. Pardon me. Let's call this one one, and this one right here. The this the what I, where I would left off at the bottom right there. I can rewrite this um, as um, we had e not i tilde because I multiplied through by the mu one over view uh, times v1 so that cancel out the den denominator minus e naught r tilde and then I've got a mu one v1 over mu two v2 so I'm just going to group that all together and call that a beta um, And if we remember that our speed is in the material is uh, equal to C over N, that means our Vs are inversely proportional to our indices of refraction. So I can write this as mu1 N2 over mu2 N1. So notice, right, the index of refraction, we've swapped them numerator and denominator because they're inversely proportional to our speeds. So I call this right here two, right? So we've got these two things where we took our electric field and our magnetic field, we imposed the boundary conditions and set, saw what they told us, all right? And so now what we're gonna do is we wanna combine them Usually what we're used to is we send in a wave and then see what comes out, right? It's kind of like a thinking of this in, in, in a time-ordered causal sense, right? Where you do something, send in an incident wave, see what results, what re gets reflected, what gets transmitted. So it would be nice instead of having these two equations where all these things are mixed up, let's um, Let's find these things um, in terms of what we are inputs. Um, and that's going to be what wave we send in and the properties of the materials, which are encompassed in beta here. All right. So we do that um, and we get this right here. And it, it just takes a bit of algebra to do it, but enough that it's not worth writing it all out for you right here. A linear, little bit of linear algebra if you want. So we get that and we get that the transmitted amplitude is this. Right, so notice in each time we've got it just in terms of the incident amplitude and beta, right? Um, and we can simplify this some more. Most of the time, right, mu one's about equal to uh, mu two, which is about equal to mu naught. Right, so then beta, all we really have is V1 over V2, 
which is the same as n2 over n1, right? So in that case, then we've got reflected complex amplitude is Right, I can multiply through by a v2, so I get a v2 minus v1. Someone's pointing at my index of refraction. So how did so? Notice again that our index of refraction is inversely proportional to the speeds. So that's why the indices two and one are flipped with respect to the speed. Oh, and what is this? This is supposed to be an N. Yes, my apologies, that's an N. I'm not making it look any better, am I? That's an N, sorry. Um, Looks like a Doppler shift. Uh, wait, wait, what, what aspect's looking like a Doppler shift? Something times V? Oh, those kinds of things. Yeah, right, 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 right. And, and so, I mean, heck, if we were to think about um, a, um, moving interface, then that would add a whole bunch more stuff to this right here, right? Um, uh, yeah, um, we, there's these ratios right here produce some really interesting physics. Um, so here, so this just becomes two, again, I'm multiplying through by V2 v2, and this is v2 plus v1. All right, so a couple things, actually. Let's compare what happens if the speed, what happens when the speeds um, are, meet different conditions. So if v2 is greater than v1, Right, then the numerator for the reflected wave is still positive. Um, it's going to be proportional to that's what that squiggle is right there proportional to not i. Right, I'm just going to say in phase. Right, but if, oh, I think I, if V2 is less than V1, right, then our reflected amplitude is proportional to minus E naught I. Right, so it's out of phase. You get a phase reversal if you go from a slow material to a fast material. Right. And so it, it, it's similar to like what we talked about before. If you've got a wave on a string and you hit whether you hit a hard boundary uh, where the string is pinned or uh, an open boundary, a loose boundary, where the string is free to slide, um, you can get either in-phase reflection or out-of-phase reflection, inverted. Um, cool. So here, let's, let me snapshot this. And then we're gonna actually, we'll keep working with these here and take a look at their implications. Okay, um, so 
keeping those things in, in mind, um, we're not so much interested in their, um, you know, we can learn from complex amplitudes, but ultimately the actual field is the real amplitude, the, the complex amplitude, useful cal calculational tool, but let's take a look at the, whoops, at the real amplitudes. All right, and so then in that case, right, our reflected field, notice I'm not putting the complex tilde over it. It's going to be V2 minus V1, or V2 plus V1. And we'll take the absolute value here. Right, because whether it's plus or minus actually is part of the phase information, which we can either fold into the phase constant, the delta, or we can fold it into the complex amplitude, E tilde, E naught tilde. Um, and so here we'll do the same thing for the transmitted. Transmitted at all we don't is always going to be in phase, so we don't have that plus or minus information because it's just two times v two in the not in the numerator. Which is, so that's always positive. Oops. Now, uh, that's supposed to be an incident. Um, we can rewrite that in terms of index of uh, index or indices of refraction. All right. Um, and so basically everywhere we had a V, we've got a one over N, and then multiplying through by N1 to N2, uh, we'll get basically reverse the roles of the indices. Ah, those aren't supposed to be Vs, it's supposed to be Ns. N1 minus N2 over N1 plus N2. And again, since we're not worried about the sign, that's really phase information. We'll take the absolute value of this. And Can reverse because it's recip the reciprocal. I'm going to reverse the roles. That's a two. Like that. Um, that's fine. But it, usually, again, for our electromagnetic waves, we don't actually measure the electric field directly unless we're doing a pretty complicated. Uh, type of experiment. Usually what we're more interested in is the intensities. Right? And remember, in our different media, our intensities, one half, depends on that permittivity right there, depends on the speed. And we're still going to use u1 not equal to So we could just square these and multiply through by the appropriate epsilons and v's, and combine them together um, to find out our reflected intensity. What we're actually often interested in is not just what the reflected intensity is. We could write the reflected intensity in terms of the incident intensity. So let's actually just go ahead and do that straight up and look at the ratio of them. So it doesn't matter. So we build in an account of how much reflected intensity we have in terms of the incident intensity. And so we're going to call this our reflection coefficient. Uh, Okay, um, so you, if we look at that, well, uh, intensity is 
in the same medium as the incident. So it's got the same epsilon and the same V. So that's going to cancel out when we write it out, right? We could here, I'll write it out, but math epsilon 1, V1, E naught, R squared. And this is still 1 half epsilon 1, V1, or E naught incident so squared. So basically that part there cancels that part there, and we're left with just the ratio of the field amplitudes squared. Um, and so you, we look up directly above there, and we get uh, you know, just a couple lines up. And this is the difference of the index of refraction divided by the sum of the index of refraction, whole thing squared. And we can do, similarly, we can talk about a transmission coefficient. And that's going to be right, our transmitted intensity in terms of our reflected intensity. But now, again, we're going to have the 1 half, which will cancel out in the numerator and the denominator. So. 1 half, 1 half, epsilon 1, I'm sorry, epsilon 2, because it's transmitted, V2, E naught transmitted squared. This is epsilon 1, V1, E naught incident squared, right? And the, the 1 halves we can cancel out, but everything else we, we have to retain because they're different, right? Um, and so, okay, if we square this, if we square this bit up here, right, um, we'll get four n1s and an n1 plus n2, sorry, four n1 squared and an n1 plus n2. But then some of those n's are going to cancel out from our n's are proportional to the square root of these of the epsilons, and they're inversely proportional to our, our v's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you plug all those things in, and what we end up with in the end is 4 n1, n2 over n1 plus n2 squared, like that. Um, so one thing we can do right here uh, is we want to check, like you see in the intensities of power per unit time per unit area. So basically it's tracking how much energy is flowing and whatever you send in has to come out. So, right, conservation of energy, point by point and, you know, moment by moment. So is that true? Ooh. Right. Is it true? Um, and so, well, since we have a limited amount of time, let's just talk through it quickly, right? So if we were to write this out right here, we would get an n1 squared minus 2n1 n2 and then plus an n2 squared, right? And the denominator is n1 squared plus 2n1 n2 plus n2 squared. And so what is the difference, you know, what is the difference between the numerator squared and the denominator squared? Well, one, we've got minus uh, 2n1 n2, and in the other one, we've got plus 2n1 n2. So the difference is, 4 n1 n2. So we add those all together, and in fact, what you get is n1 squared plus 2 n1 n2 plus n2 squared over the exact same thing. So that's equal to 1. So the answer is check. Yes, it does. We have conserved energy. Um, okay, and so. Um, if you go from air glass, right, what you can stick in the numbers right there. Um, let's 
here. Give me one second and, and we'll end with that. Um, with just one example. Uh, no. All right. About equal to index of fractions, about equal to one. Class index of refraction is about equal to one and a half, right? So you stick those numbers in and you get a reflection coefficient that's about equal to 4%. And so the transmission coefficient is about 96%. Um, so most light goes through the interface, right? And that makes sense, right? You can see through a pane of glass. Um, but it's actually something that, that you need to pay attention to, right? You can see reflections off of a pane of, of glass. Um, and if you've got a whole bunch of pieces of glass, like in a compound camera lens, right, where you've got all kinds of surfaces like this. So in this one right here, I've got the one camera lens has four pieces of glass in it. So that had eight uh, um, surfaces, right? Because it's every interface where you have this issue, right? And so in this case, T is going to be equal to 0 0.96 to the eighth power. Right, and so all of a sudden, right? So because there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Each of those surfaces, and so you stick that in. I've got out my calculator right here. 0.96 lits um, square there that. And square that, and right all of a sudden you've got about like 0 0.72, right? So you've lost the lost more than a quarter of your light, right? So it's a starts to add up to a significant loss in that situation. Is that right? No, something wasn't. It's got to be worse than that. Um, no, that's right. So um, yeah, problems. Um, so what do we do? Um, so you get what's known as anti AR, anti-reflection codes. Um, that's why if you look at a good camera lens, it looks a little bit kind of colored uh, slightly if you look at the reflection off of it. And that's because there's this anti-reflection uh, coating, which is suppressing most of the reflection. And you're just seeing a little tiny residual amount. Um, cool. All right. I'm over. So I um, want to encourage you to send me questions about the exam uh, as you work on it. Uh, but you can see we're starting to get a little bit, little tiny bit into optics here. We'll do a whole bunch more. We will quickly recover all of the ray optics that you learned in our next class. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. See you all. Have a good one. Oh, and Camille, if you're still here, um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the what you missed? Dr. Grossman, are you still there? I am. 
You want to? Do you want to? I logged out. <clears throat> Say again. I accidentally logged out. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to? Did you want to talk a little bit about um the the beginning, what we were doing, stuff like that? Can I have the opportunity to like rewatch the video first, and then if I have any yep. questions, come back and ask you? Yeah, that sounds great. W wonderful. Okay. Um, you know, um, give it a few minutes. There seems to be a lag for until it, it comes uh, up. Um, and then, um, so you can either watch it on Blackboard, or if you want to be able to watch it at, at faster speeds, um, you have to wait for me to get it up onto to YouTube, and you can watch it there. So whichever okay. one you want. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Yep. Feel free to to reach out though if you've got questions. Alrighty. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.